Hi, my name is John Branson. I'm the president of uh, Summit Self Consulting, a consulting company here in Southern California. Today, I'm going to talk to you about PCI Express physical layer uh, to give you an overview of uh, the physical layer technology and with emphasis on the electrical parts of it. Later presentations will be uh, more concerned with the protocol aspects of PCI Express. So PCI Express is actually not a bus, uh, but a point-to-point -point link. So it's a high-speed uh, bi-directional serial link, uh, which starts at 2.5 gigabits uh, per second uh, for generation 1, and then you have gen 2 and 3, 5 and 8 gigabits per second. Uh, and it can be scaled uh, by using multiple lanes in parallel, up to 32 lanes. So the clock used by uh, the serial link is encoded within the serial data stream itself using 8B, 10B encoding. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit more about that uh, later. Uh, PC Express maintains software backwards compatibility uh, with regards to configuration space registers, uh, plug and play for operating systems. And it's also backwards compatible with regards to IO and memory map device registers. If you have a device driver, working with PCI today, it can very easily be moved uh, or imported to PCI Express without much changes. Uh, and there's no length matching between lanes needed uh, as in higher speed PCI X, not PCIe, but PCI X, the parallel version, uh, ran at very high clock speeds. So you had to be very careful with ma length matching the uh, traces for that bus. That's uh, a lot easier now in PCI Express. Um, so after uh, having used parallel buses for 21 years, PCI Express now have uh, high-speed serial bus technologies. And the parallel data is essentially serialized using shift registers and sent in serial format gigabit per second link frequencies. And 8B, 10B encoding was patented by IBM in 1984 and used in fiber channel and uh, a lot of other link protocols today. Um, so again, 8B, 10B encoding allows data to be encoded in such a way that the clock signal can be embedded within the signal serial data sent. Uh, and this again allows the receiver to synchronize its local receiver clock to the same clock the data was sent with, which is important at uh, gigabit frequencies to maintain synchronized uh, uh, reception. So here we have a picture of uh, PCI Express versus PCI slots. So at the top here you can see that uh, you have PCIe connectors and at the bottom you have PCI. Uh, there's actually a different pitch and uh, pin out on these connectors. So you cannot use an old PCI card in the PCIe slot and so forth, uh, and uh, vice versa. And the keying is also different here. So uh, to um, prevent people from doing that. So the yellow slot here, 16 uh, by 16 uh, card lane is generally used by uh, high bandwidth uh, cards like uh, graphics adapters, but it's gonna also be used by uh, any other card that fits in the slot. So the slot width, the number of lanes, will actually be negotiated uh, during a uh, link initialization. So if you have a uh, by one card, you can move it to the by 16 uh, connector and it will work just fine. So some uh, nomenclature, uh, there are links and there are lanes. So, a lane is a, uh, simply a pair of uh, physical traces uh, making a lane bidirectional. So you have a differential pair, uh, one for TX and one for RX, and those are both simplex. So by having one going downstream and one upstream, you form a lane. Uh, a link then is a collection of lanes and you can have up to 32 uh, lanes per link.
And here's another example of uh, the differential analog signaling used. Um, so essentially the original signal as well as its inverted version will be sent to a subtractor which will basically give you the difference. So uh, something positive minus something negative becomes positive plus something else positive which will double the output pulse. So if each pulse here is 400 millivolt span, the output differential span will be 800 uh, millivolt peak to peak. And here's the advantage of doing that. If you have a noise signal that uh, affects both lines uh, simultaneously with equal amplitude and phase, then the subtractor will basically not, afterwards will not see it because they will cancel out. So that minus that will be nothing. Here we have a uh, picture of the uh, differential signaling, how it's actually implemented uh, in the driver and uh, receiver sides. So on the driver side, you see they have a uh, current source. There's essentially driving a three and a half or four, no more normally, uh, milliamp uh, current through the one of the single-ended traces within the differential pair, and it drops. Uh, 400 millivolt over 100 ohm, um, 350 or 400 millivolt across the 100 ohm resistor, and then it goes back again. So it forms a loop through the differential pairs. And one advantage with that is that it does not go, the return current does not go through the ground plane, so it has very low EMI, uh, the differential signaling. Now, when sending high-speed uh, signals through a PCB, uh, high-frequency content of the signal will be attenuated uh, by losses in long PCB or cable runs, and this results in slower edge transitions at the receiver. So, if you have a uh, square wave uh, going into a uh, channel, could be a cable or PCB, what you will get out, if it's a very high frequency content in that signal, in other words, very sharp uh, transitions, then you will see that the output have, will have smoothed out edges. And uh, by increasing the voltage of transition bits uh, on the transmitting side, uh, in other words, you will send in more frequency, high frequency content uh, we can recover the correct waveform at the channel outputs. Um, and the way that works then is um, you basically undo the ill effects of the channel or the PCB traces so you get the correct um, shape of the waveform when it comes out on the other side. And uh, using pre-emphasis then will combat uh, inter-symbol interference or ISI. So you can see here, for instance, that the signal actually doesn't uh, reach the low level. It should go down to this level, but before, because it's slowed down to such a point uh, because of the low pass filtering effect of the PCB, it actually only goes halfway down before it goes up again. And by using pre-emphasis, you can actually make it go all the way down. Data scrambling. Uh, PCI Express uh, uses uh, something called uh, pseudo-random data scrambling uh, to spread off the RF energy in the frequency spectrum, uh, which then results in uh, less EMI or electromagnetic interference. It essentially accomplishes this by using a linear feedback shift registers um, on the both sending and receiving side. Uh, and uh, and LFSR maintains an internal state machine, which is the top uh, 16 uh, flip-flops, uh, which then are reset at a certain point in the data, whenever you get a uh, comma symbol, which is a K28.1. Uh, the data then is passed through these shift registers and then uh, there is an XOR operation being done between the state of the LFSR and the actual data. And by doing that, you will have a predictable and repeatable 
sequence of pseudo-random uh, data coming out on this side. So every time you, you, if you reset the LFSR and you send at the same point and you send the same data in, you will always get the same pseudo-random data out with a predefined uh, uh, sequence. Now the trick uh, to make this work is that the receiver uses an identical LFSR uh, with the same logic composition uh, and if the receiver is resetting uh, its LFSR at the same position in the data stream, that is when it receives a COM symbol or K28.1, then by doing the same XOR operation on the received bit stream, it will actually recover the original data on the receiver side, which is very clever. Now, in addition to uh, the scrambling to lower EMI and the uh, spread out the frequency spectrum content of the signal, uh, PC Express also uses 8B, 10B encoding. Um, so, as it says here, that uh, 8B, 10B encoding replaces each scrambled uh, byte with a 10-bit code before sending the 10-bit code on the link after it is serialized. And the replacement is simply a direct um, lookup table based on the scrambled data byte and the current running disparity of the link. And then the running disparity is simply the difference between the number of sent ones and the number of sent zeros. And then the goal then is to have the disparity as close to zero as possible. And uh, by doing that, you will actually uh, keep the electrical DC balance on the link as close to zero as possible. You can imagine if you have more uh, ones than zeros, then you will actually over time, you would increase um, the um, DC balance because the uh, traces uh, gets charged more and more and more and it starts creeping up. And if it creeps up far enough, then the receiver cannot actually recover the voltage because it's too high. Uh, for the receiver to deal with. Now, by using uh, the 8B, 10B encoding, uh, it allows the 10B, 10B symbols to be chosen such that uh, the data stream has enough transition so that the receiver can synchronize this 2.5 gigabit PLL to the uh, data stream. And by doing that, you can then use a receiver clock and data recovery uh, to retrieve both the clock and the data accurately on the receiving side. And uh, this slide then uh, shows an example of that. The uh, transmitter sends the 10B encoded data. You have then a PLL on the receive side, uh, which then uh, is clocked at two and a half gigabit, and then it locks, uh, synchronizes its face with the transitions in the a received data stream and it recovers then a, a um, two and a half gigahertz clock that is then used to clock in the uh, data bits. Now then, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, you can have multiple lanes uh, on a uh, PCI Express link. So the question then becomes uh, how is the data actually multiplexed across those lanes? and uh, when a link with multiple lanes, so this is a by four multiple uh, lane link uh, shown. The hardware blocks uh, inside the uh, uh, FPGA or ASIC uh, will actually uh, stripe the data across. So you start by putting the first byte in uh, lane zero and then in one and two and three and so on. And then it continues. So it'll be striped across. And then the receiver will look for a new packet, always in lane zero, uh, and then continue the striping. Um, and this, of course, allows the bandwidth to easily be uh, multiplied by simply adding more lanes. Um, the regular I devices um, typically have by one to by four link widths and graphic adapters typically used by 16 because they're very bandwidth 
hungry. If PGAs uh, normally use by four service hardware, uh, either at Gen 1 or Gen 2 uh, speeds, so that allows you either one or two gigabytes per second IO bandwidth uh, if you're implementing your PCI Express uh, endpoint device in, in FPGA. And uh, here then are some numbers for the actual bandwidth you can get. And it varies then for, uh, from PCI Express 1 from 250 megabytes per lane up to PCI Express 4, 1600 megabytes per lane. Uh, so if you are implementing your FPGA endpoint, you will probably use uh, PCI Express 1 or 2, so you can get up to uh, uh, a few, a couple of gigabytes per second uh, IO bandwidth, which should be plenty for most applications, of course. So, uh, link training. When a link comes up, uh, both peers, they negotiate data rate, uh, polarity inversion, lane D skew, and lane and lane number. And uh, speed, of course, uh, if one, let's say the host, uh, supports uh, Gen 2 PCI Express and a device, an older Gen 1 device, is inserted in that slot to a motherboard, a piece of motherboard, and there has to be a negotiation. And it's always the lowest, lowest common denominator uh, that determines uh, what speed uh, it will run at. So in that scenario, uh, the link would run at Gen 1. Polarity inversion, if you have um, traces on the board that's easier to route by simply uh, switching the plus and minus um, conductors within a differential pair. Uh, the receiver will actually notice that uh, when the link is initialized and it will be automatically uh, inverted in hardware again. So it undoes your inversion and becomes uh, normal again. So polarity inversion, uh, the differential plus and minus signals can be swapped electrically if physically crossed, and that's done automatically in hardware. Lane and lane disk, you have talked about that a little bit before. Um, so any delay between lanes in the link are calibrated away uh, in hardware again. Lane and lane number reversal. Um, normally, you have the lanes numbered 0 to 3. Uh, you can reverse them again on your PCB if it eases the actual routing, and then it will be that the reversion will be undone, basically or compensated for in hardware by changing the lane numbering. Now this link training is negotiated via training sets, ordered sets, which are uh, exchanged when the link is being brought up. So <clears throat> something. Um, very important uh, with high-speed serial signaling is signal integrity, of course, uh, because a bit in uh, Gen 1, uh, two and a half gigabit is only 400 picosecond long, and that, of course, uh, for Gen 2 and so on, will be uh, only 200 picosecond, and Gen 3, even worse, uh, will be down to around 100 uh, picosecond. Uh, then it's very important that you don't have uh, any uh, reflections, impedance, discontinuities that will call, cause ringing and so forth uh, on the link. So that's something you really need to check on the receiver side uh, to make sure that the signal integrity is proper. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see here in the diagram uh, to the right, uh, once it goes through a long channel, could be a cable or um, uh, PCB, you can see that the amplitude has dropped. And you can also see that there's jitter here uh, due to reflections, uh, probably accounted when passing uh, connectors, for instance, that are not completely uh, well adapted for use with PCI Express. Each connector actually is not perfect. It has some extra inductance that causes reflections because the impedance uh, will not be exactly matched to the impedance uh, of the signal coming in and out. Um, and then attenuation here is caused by low pass filtering effects of cable and PCB. I will talk about it a little bit later. Uh, jitter can also be uh, caused by electrical noise in the transmitter. Could be power supply noise, 
uh, random thermal noise and channel effects such as ISI, crosstalk, impedance, discontinuities, etc. And as I mentioned before, that the pre-emphasis is used to compensate for channel losses and attenuation. And uh, of course, excessive jitter and attenuation uh, would cause trouble for receivers uh, because they may not be able to lock on to the data stream uh, if there's not enough eye opening here uh, to uh, correctly uh, sample the signal. And uh, here we have an example of um, a little test board with two SMA connectors and a little differential line going through it. And uh, the graph to the right is a TDR uh, graph uh, where you can see the impedance uh, coming in is 50 ohm. So this part here is the actual cable that's connected over here. It's pretty much 50 ohm. As soon as you get to the connector because of the impedance, extra impedance that the connector has, uh, you will see a spike in the characteristic uh, impedance. And then as you go into the transmission line, which are these differential pairs here, you can see also that they're not completely well matched. They're more closer to 46 ohm instead of 50. And then as you reach the other connector, you have that uh, inductive hump again, and then it goes back to 50 ohm impedance of the cable coming out. So uh, important is that uh, the characteristic impedance must be 50 ohm single element or 100 ohm differential across all traces and uh, conductors. Any uh, deviation in impedance will cause reflections, jitter, and eye closure. Uh, wider copper traces uh, result in higher capacitance, which will lower the impedance. Connectors typically have uh, less capacitance, so overall inductive above means higher uh, impedance. So the formula for uh, calculating uh, the uh, characteristic impedance is uh, essentially Z0 is the square root of L uh, divided by C and that means that if C increases for instance because of wider conductor uh, then it would decrease the uh, characteristic impedance and cause some reflection. Um, there's another tip uh, if you're running uh, long runs of uh, cable or uh, PCB traces, keep them under tens of inches. If you have tens of inches, you might actually cut down the uh, receiving signal level to about half of what was transferred or transmitted. Uh, so as an example, if you have a... Uh, link frequency of 5 gigahertz, you can here see that it's approximately 0 0.6 dB per inch. Um, so if you have about 10 inches, you get 6 dB, uh, which reduces the receiver eye diagram to about half. Um, and the dielectric loss, the green curve, is essentially what causes the attenuation of the signal. Uh, by uh, reorienting and heating the molecules in the PCB material because uh, it's a di dielectric, it actually absorbs part of the energy that you send in into the transmission line uh, and that um, mainly acts as the low pass filter uh, that I talked about before because the high frequency content is what it's kind of like a microwave oven uh, the higher frequencies are more easily absorbed by the material, like the food or water molecules in the food. Um, also, you can see here that the, uh, the conductor loss, which is essentially a um, skin effect, is not linear with the frequency. It mostly drops under 1 gigahertz and then pretty much stays content, constant, regardless of the frequency. Um, Skin effect is the tendency of uh, high frequency currents to be pushed to the surface of the conductors, uh, causing increased resistance. So you can kind of see it as a uh, uh, hollowed out uh, conductor. So you only have the outermost surface to pass the current through, and that of course increases the resistance compared to a, a solid conductor. And uh, you can use reed drivers then to, uh, to clean up the signal integrity, amplitude, and jitter without much uh, ill side effects. 
So if you need to run long distances, you uh, have to insert the read drivers. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the reason for the low frequency effect of uh, running uh, high uh, speed signals through a PCB. And uh, it all comes back to Fourier analysis. Uh, so per the Fourier analysis, a square wave, which is the yellow curve here, uh, it's made up of sine waves of multiple frequencies. So the more high frequency content of the square wave is removed, the more the resulting waveform looks like a sine wave. And you can see that, that the lowest fundamental sine wave in here has the same period as the square wave. And then you have more harmonics and higher frequency components within that square wave. And if the high frequency components are removed, then what you're left with is essentially a sine wave, which has, of course, a lot slower rise and fall time than the actual square wave. And that's what happens when you pass it through a PCB. And of course, as I showed you before, uh, if you don't keep an eye on this, then signals will be too slow to actually change states between the bits and ISI, then intersymbol interference will result. Uh, so in general, tens of inches should be fine, but if you're moving to really fast at Gen 2 and Gen 3 speeds, then you have to use the read drivers to, uh, to clean that situation up. So here's some more notes about length matching. So there's no need to match lanes with other lanes. Uh, the D-skew will uh, automatically compensate for that in hardware. The way this works is that when the link is initialized, you will send periodic uh, um, training sequence order sets in parallel across these lanes. Here I'm showing the uh, COM uh, skip order sets uh, that are in parallel. Training sequences are sent in parallel across the lanes uh, downstream and upstream too. Um, so for instance, what the uh, PC Express analyzer has done here, it has aligned all these order sets in time so that they all arrive at the same time. And of course the receivers uh, in PC Express, all of them have to do the same thing in order for the striping to work across lanes. Uh, if you didn't do that, then you would stripe uh, one byte and then you would get one byte that was off by one tick and so on. And then of course, uh, nothing would work. So between lanes, you're allowed to have uh, up to five symbol time skew across all the lanes. Uh, so, since you have 400 nanosecond per bit and there are 10 bits per symbol, you have 4 nanoseconds per symbol. Um, and 5 symbols then would be 20 nanoseconds. And in 20 nanoseconds, assuming 6 inch propagation delay per nanosecond, the physical lane trace length difference can be up to 120 inches or about 10 feet, which is very long. And if you think about that, then you realize that matching lanes within one board uh, is not necessary, of course. So in PC Express, you do have to length match uh, the signals within a differential pair of a lane uh, to five mils, five thousandths of an inch. Uh, if you don't, then you will cause some differential to common mode voltage conversion and you get distortion of the signal and also you're starting to have some problems with the EMI uh, as well. And here's an example then of a correct uh, length matching within a differential pair. You see that it crosses uh, symmetrically across the common mode voltage. Uh, if you don't have it um, properly length matched, one would cross the detection point sooner than the other and you will start having this common mode conversion causes EMI and crosstalk. It's not uh, super critical for uh, uh, PCI 1 in my experience but uh, uh, since it's easy to do uh, just keep the length matching too. So here's an example of um, a Certis implementation on an Altera FPGA. The blue part at the top is the receiver side of it and the yellow part is the transmitter side. So I'm going to walk you through uh, the whole change from transmitting 
to the wire and coming back and recovering the original um, data. Um, so I'm gonna give you a quick overview first here. I just name each block and then I'm gonna walk through each block on a separate slide so you can see more detail of what they're doing. So here you have on the transceiver side, uh, the uh, hard IP. In some FPGAs you have hard IP and in some FPGAs they have soft PCI Express IP. Um, the hard ones uh, has the advantage that um, you save some uh, FPGA fabric logic elements so you don't have to use that for the PCI Express endpoint implementation. Phase compensation FIFO over here. Uh, you have a byte serializer, you have an 8-bit 10-bit encoder, you have a bit serializer, it comes back and the clock is being recovered. Uh, where the liner is actually not used in uh, PCI Express, you have a DSKU FIFO, rate matching FIFO, you have the 8-bit 10-bit decoder, byte serializer, byte ordering, RX phase compensation FIFO, uh, goes to the pipe interface and then back into the hard IP on the other side and then back up to the FPGA logic to act on it. So as you can see, there are a lot of pieces here, uh, which is uh, quite uh, complex, but I will break it down for you. Uh, so it will be easy to understand. So now on the transmitting side then, you have the uh, hard IP, which implements the transaction layer. So your FPGA fabric then would create, using state machines or some other IP perhaps, uh, transaction layer packets, uh, and then pass it on to the uh, hard IP or soft IP up here in the FPGA uh, fabric. Uh, that would then be passed through the pipe interface and down for transmission. Uh, the pipe interface, by the way, is standardized uh, in an Intel spec, so you can Google Google that. Pipe stands for uh, physical interface for PCI Express. And uh, here we have the TX phase compensation 5 volt byte serializer and 8 bit 10 b encoder. So, because the internal FPGA parallel pipe clock might not be exactly synchronized to the external PCI Express clock, uh, we need to cross clock domains going from the inside FPGA to what goes uh, further downstream. Uh, and that is done using the phase compensation FIFO. A phase compensation FIFO uh, is really a fancy name for a dual clock uh, FIFO. Uh, it's nothing else. Now the FPGA uh, has a limitation on um, the clock frequency that you can use in the fabric. Uh, so it doesn't work very well. It's hard to close timing at 250 megahertz. Uh, so what's done is that you are passing data around 16 bit at a time, two bytes at 125 megahertz. And then the byte serializer here would actually convert between two bytes at 125 megahertz to one bytes at 250 which is then is used uh, more downstream in the, in the hardware. Uh, now, all these yellow blocks here that I showed, and also the blue one on the receive side, is implemented in silicon. So it doesn't have the limitation of running at high, uh, or not running at high clock uh, speeds like the uh, fabric. Uh, so this runs fine at 250 megahertz. The stuff inside the FPGA needs to run at 125. Uh, and then the 8B, 10B encoder uh, creates the 10B codes required for the uh, DC bias and clock encoding I talked about before. Uh, you can actually look at the IBM patent for the uh, uh, 8B, 10B encoding from 1984. Patent number US4486739, it's on Google. So uh, on the TX side, we finally have uh, the bit serializers, which converts from the 10-bit uh, data uh, into a serial bit stream, which is then clocked out onto the uh, link. 
and uh, again it uses the 100 megahertz reference clock uh, to drive the TXPLL that generates the 2.5 uh, gigahertz clock frequency which drives the bit serializer. Now on the receiving side uh, it does exactly the opposite to what the transmitter did. Uh, it first receives the uh, differential serial data, uh, recovers the two and a half gigahertz clock uh, by again using the reference clock to drive an RXPLL that generates a 2.5 gigahertz uh, clock signal. It face locks it to the uh, 10B encoded clock on the data and it recovers the bits stream. Once the uh, parallel data has been received on the receiver side, it is de-skewed. Now it says here word aligner, that's actually not used in the uh, Altera FPGA uh, in PC Express mode, so just ignore that. Uh, the D-skew FIFO here does the lane to lane D-skew to line them all up in time. Um, so again, the protocol analyzer has, has already done that because if, you, if it hadn't done that, you would see this lane maybe one or two ticks in time it would differ, so it wouldn't be lined up in time. All the receivers do that as part of the link uh, training. The next block on the receiving side is the rate matching FIFO. Uh, because the sending uh, CERDES may not have exactly the same 2.5 uh, uh, gigahertz clock speed as the receiving side has, uh, they use the rate matching FIFO to uh, avoid underflow or overflow of the FIFO itself. And the way that works is that um, this FIFO can uh, remove skip order sets, symbols, in case it's about to overflow, so it throws away some data. Uh, skip order sets are uh, is something that only exists uh, between the hardware on the sending side and the receiving side uh, and would actually never be used by the uh, transaction layer uh, protocol. Uh, so by throwing it away, it uh, doesn't really matter to the receiver. Uh, afterwards, the 8B, 10B decoder would simply decode whatever was encoded on the other side. In other words, you would recover the original 8-bit data and K and D indicator. Um, and K symbols are essentially uh, 10 special control symbols used for packet framing, symbol alignment, clock uh, frequency compensation, etc. Step four uh, of five on the receiving side is the uh, byte deserializer. So again, uh, the FPGA fabric is rather slow, so it doesn't run on, uh, it cannot handle the 250 megahertz clock speed. So uh, the clock speed is lowered and the path is widened to 16 bits. So you get out here two bytes at 125 megahertz, which are being passed on to the FPGA fabric. Uh, the very last step then is the RX phase compensation FIFO, which is essentially a dual clocked FIFO to cross into the clock domain used in the FPGA side. To um, validate a physical board design or, or uh, backplane, uh, you would need to use a high-speed oscilloscope. Um, as I showed you in the uh, previous slide regarding Fourier analysis, to recover uh, the uh, complete square wave and the high-frequency contents of it, you would need a, uh, a scope that uh, has approximately five times the analog bandwidth of the fundamental frequency uh, within the signal you're analyzing and for a gen 1 2.5 gigabit uh, 10b encoded signal 
which then has the highest fundamental frequency of 1.25. There's uh, one high bit and one low bit uh, per cycle. So the highest frequency toggling uh, rates of a PCI uh, Express Gen 1 signal is uh, 1.25 gigahertz and not two and a half. So you need five times one, two, five, or approximately six gigahertz oscilloscope to analyze a Gen 1 link. Uh, the same math then um, uh, tells you that you need a 12 gigahertz scope for a Gen 2, five gig uh, link, or 20 gigahertz for Gen 3, eight gig. If you want to analyze uh, the digital uh, aspects of the physical communication. You need a PCI Express protocol analyzer. Uh, this is uh, a unit that I designed for international test instruments. Uh, and uh, it does everything that a receiver would need to do on the receiving service side to capture and interpret the data. And that means that um, it does the de-skew of the data that comes in to line it up in time. It does the descrambling using the linear feedback shift register method. Uh, and it also uses the, uh, uh, the 8B, 10B uh, decoder to uh, decode the actual uh, raw hex data uh, that's being sent on the link. For more information on this uh, unit, you can go to internationaltestinstruments.com. Uh, now, if you want to learn more uh, about the physical interface of PC Express, of course, there are a lot of sources. Uh, these two first books uh, are written by Intel Press, uh, PCIe Electrical Interconnect Design and uh, the Complete PCIe Reference. And you have the books, of course, from uh, Mindshare as well, the PC Express Technology uh, books, three uh, and earlier ones as well. Um, finally, uh, some words about uh, my company, Summits of Consulting. It was funded by me uh, about 15 years ago. I've been in the business for uh, 20 years doing electronics and software engineering. Uh, had extensive experience with microcontrollers, digital and analog electronics, Windows software and device drivers, high-speed board design, signal and power integrity, FPGA digital design, USB, PCI Express protocol analyzer design, and much more. Uh, in particular, uh, I'm the chief designer for uh, uh, international test instruments. I designed their um, 1480A USB uh, 2.0 protocol analyzer, their uh, USB 5000A, USB 3.0, uh, 5 gigabit per second uh, protocol analyzer, and also the protocol analyzer I showed you, the um, uh, 2500A uh, by four lane PC Express protocol analyzer. So if you uh, need help, designing or debugging issues with uh, FPGA, uh, device drivers uh, communicating with USB or um, PCI Express uh, devices, I can be of help. I hope you found this uh, presentation interesting. Uh, I will create some more uh, separate uh, videos that cover the um, the uh, communication related packets used on PC Express and uh, that should be online within a couple of weeks. Thank you.